for this introduction. Uh, welcome everybody to this webinar. My name is Martin van Werkhoven. I'm very happy to uh, be able to do this webinar. Um, good afternoon. Um, I'm talking from the Netherlands, so here it is afternoon. But good morning to the people in, to the uh, west and good evening, I think, people in the east. Um, um, as Roman told us, we are doing a webinar on electric motor systems with a supply to targeting and implementing efficiency improvements. Um, we have five sections, chapters, so to say, uh, on the subject, a short introduction of myself and the program, then some slides on efficient motor systems, what do we mean by that, what are we talking about, then a section about standards and policies, what are the current standards and what kind of policies uh, uh, are in place, uh, should become in place. And then section four and five, more towards the end user, what are steps for end users to optimize their motor systems. Um, short introduction of myself, Martin van Werkhoven, I'm a consultant with the TPA Advisors. Uh, I'm experienced uh, in uh, executing a lot of projects on energy efficiency in production sites, in buildings and policies. Uh, mainly focused on industry, um, and one special item, of course, are motor systems, electric motor systems. They're um, active as operating agent uh, of the um, EMSA, the annex, uh, uh, electric motor system annex, which is an annex to the implementing agreement for E. I'll tell something more about it later. And two Dutch programs uh, here in the Netherlands, one program on efficient motor systems, Green Deal, and the other one is the Knowledge Network on Motor Systems, which is a sort of cooperation between three trade organizations and uh, the Dutch Energy Agency. EMSA stands for Electric Motor Systems Annex. It's a cooperation between six countries, um, Australia, uh, Austria, uh, Denmark, Netherlands, United States, and Switzerland. And it's, uh, we're now in our third phase. The program runs three years, up to 2017. And I have um, this web link here where you can check more on our actual activities. Um, EMSA focuses on efficient motor systems. And therefore, their philosophy is to uh, enhance this market transformation, to, to quicken it up, to, to speed it up. Uh, and therefore, we need, on a different level, uh, activities. On a global level, we need to strive for harmonizing global standards, because with those global standards, it's possible for, uh, on a national level, for governments, to define and implement successful policies. Policies which should get companies into action in really implementing their motor systems, uh, making the motor systems more efficient. So for that, they need uh, energy management systems and audits. And in order to make those companies uh, make personal, really uh, uh, um, uh, have the capacity to do those audits, they need tools and information. So on the, these four levels, EMSA is, is active in employing projects, uh, helping uh, forming those standards, defining policies, etc. That's in a nutshell the activity of uh, for EMSA. Um, that's a, as a short introduction. Efficient motor systems, what do we mean by that? Um, we will get into that. First of all, one big one important item to, 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 to share with you is the big share of motor systems in the global electricity use. Uh, on a global level, 46% of electricity goes into motor systems, which is huge. So addressing this uh, portion of electricity use and trying to get it more efficient is very worthwhile. Looking more in detail into industry, uh, there we see that the portion of uh, electricity used by motor systems is much lar larger. More than two-thirds of the electricity used in industry goes into motor systems. 
uh, with other sectors, for instance, uh, dwellings and services, this share of electricity from motor systems is, uh, is lower. So it makes much sense to start with industry if we want to address uh, improving efficiency of motor systems. To the, uh, looking more in detail, um, what kind of motors, uh, what kind of applications are driven by those motors, then we see uh, the vision into uh, pumps, uh, air compressor systems, cooling systems, fan systems, and one more large portion also, more than one third, into other uh, applications for processes, conveyor belts, etc. So these are the main sections of applications of motor systems. Um, having said that, having seen that motor systems uh, use a very large portion of the electricity, next step is the uh, uh, looking into what is possible in terms of savings. This slide shows us um, a graph with um, the different policy options which are there. When doing nothing, when not implementing any policy on efficient motor systems, we will see this result, the red line showing us the energy use uh, for the, the, the coming years, up to 2030, the study year was, uh, was performed. Um, but we have uh, policy options to choose from. When we choose a policy scenario and implementing policies on motor systems, on efficient motor systems, then we see that this electricity use will uh, lower up to 20%, up to 2030 is possible. And even one step further is possible if we apply uh, the lowest uh, life cycle cost scenario, so to say. Um, then this uh, electricity use can be lowered by 30%. So this means that uh, with the current technology available, um, it is economically viable uh, um, to save 20 up to 30% of the current electricity used by motor systems. That's the main message of this graph and of this study. Uh, but that leads us to ask the question, how can we do that? What do we have to do in order to really harvest this big potential of energy savings? Um, for that, we first focus on motor systems. What do we exactly mean by motor systems? By motor systems, we mean the uh, um, combination of these components. Of course, starting with the motor itself, but also uh, having uh, a control in place, VFD or other control, uh, a mechanical equipment like a gear, a belt, or a, a trans trans transmission, and um, the application itself, for instance, a pump, a fan, and a compressor. This together forms a motor-driven unit. But the system, we're looking at the system, we also have to take into account the depth system, for instance, with the pumping system, and the flow itself. Uh, the flow, uh, uh, this in fact defines the real uh, uh, combination of components and making it to, uh, into an optimal uh, uh, drive, of, uh, optimal motor system, so to say. Um, so motor systems drive the applications like pumps, fans, compressors, etc. And what we see also is that um, they can be improved, of course, in existing applications, but also in new systems. It's very um, important that all those components are combined together in the most optimum, optimal way. Now we're talking, of course, about industry, but also infrastructure and building systems. In all those systems, uh, if improvements can be made. And then we're talking about those improvements, about 20 to 30 percent savings of uh, the electricity used by those systems. Bearing in mind the two-thirds of the industry, meaning that on uh, industrial scale, uh, 14 up to 20 percent of the net electricity used in industry can be saved by optimizing your motor systems. This is a picture of an uh, actual uh, motor system, the ventilation system, consisting of this uh, motor. We have the, uh, the belt, the fan, 
and also we see sort of start of the duct system. Together, this makes an actual real life motor system. Our third section will be on standards and policies for motor systems. Um, first of all, the question, why do we need globally harmonized standards? This picture is a sort of, as a metaphor for uh, motors. Uh, it's a picture of a, the back of a, a car. And cars are manufactured and sold all over the world. Uh, but what do we see then? We see that every country has its own standards for the size of the license plate and the way it should be uh, uh, made, uh, uh, bolted to, to the car. So um, what every car, every country has its own standard, leading to that we need a lot of different holes like this just to make one license plate to a car. That's not really optimal. Um, you can imagine it should be more, much more easier having one standard license plate, only then you need two holes at the most to bolt the license plate to the car. That's not the case. Well, the same you could say is applicable to motors. Motors here we see uh, a group of motor standards uh, for line operated AC motors. And this is a good, nice set of uh, standards, but um, meaning that <clears throat> in this group of standards from the IEC, the International Electrical Committee, uh, that um, you only have a fine group of standards when uh, the scope is defined, the scope for the product itself, how is it used, what kind of te technologies are included in its, in its product. Um, then testing, the testing standard for one preferred testing method, making it uh, able to uh, do testing, check testing of the product itself, uh, and really validating the real efficiency of that product. Uh, having a standard in place for the efficiency classes itself, uh, the IE cl classification, so to say, for motors, running at, the, as, at this moment up to IE4, um, and a set of, in this case, a guide, uh, giving guidance to how to optimize your motor system. Um, so this set of standards is in place, but still what you see is that um, uh, every country uh, these standards, I must say, are nationally ad adopted most of the time, but they're not always 100% copied. Uh, every, uh, most uh, national governments have the tendency to, to add their own national context and make their own national exceptions. So even with, with, this, with this kind of, uh, this group of modern standards, you see that there's a need for harmonization. Um, this is a con continuous process. The last but at least I'd like to mention here the fifth element of this group of standards, that's the certification scheme. And this scheme makes it possible to, on a global level, uh, execute uh, uh, check testings, uh, and also defining a global label, making it possible for motor manufacturers to use one label only, but also making it much more easier for governments to uh, really put in place uh, the enforcement. Uh, so on both sides, from manufacturers uh, point of view, but also for the point of view from governments, it's very worthwhile uh, working towards one global label for efficiency of separate products. This is the scheme of the motor efficiency classification. Uh, we see here a graph with on the uh, horizontal scale the output power of the motor and on the vertical scale the or the axis the efficiency of the motor. Um, we see here five levels of efficiency. The first four are yet uh, part of this uh, standard, 6034-30-1. Um, and the fifth is envisaged for the ne next version of this standard. Uh, what we see is that on a lower level of uh, power, upper power, 
the differences between the, the uh, separate classification levels are higher. For instance, for one kilowatt, we see between I1 and I2 more than 5% of difference between uh, efficiency. At a higher output rate, we see this difference is much smaller. Uh, for instance, uh, at uh, 200 kilowatts, it's only 1% at the most between the different uh, um, scales. But not meaning that it is less important, for instance, because the large motors, you talk about large uh, power outputs, they run most of the time, quite, quite some time per year. So uh, that even then leads to a lot of cured hours to be saved, making uh, putting into place a one step more efficient model. Um, okay. Making a step towards the interaction of stakeholders who are involved in defining those those standards and why, uh, what is the relationship between those uh, stakeholders? Um, the scheme shows us that, that um, governments are um, the first parties to, uh, they are in place, they are the only parties who can uh, define MAPS, which means minimum energy performance standards on a national level, but in order to uh, make it possible for them to really define that, they need standards. They need standards made by the IEC, in fact, uh, they issued by IEC, but are made, defined by industry. So, um, um, having said that, um, government needs those standards, but at the same time, they can also put some pressure upon those, yeah. the industry in order to make those standards. So they really um, interact all together in order to really um, define the maps which lead to higher efficiency of motor systems. Uh, in the scheme, we also see this IECEE, uh, which uh, really is involved in certification and compliance, because having maps in place uh, means also that there should be some enforcement defined. Having maps without enforcement doesn't lead to really uh, uh, any savings. You really need a solid system of certification and compliance in order to make sure that the maps are followed by manufacturers. So this is the interaction between those stakeholders. Further on, we see how the um, policy, um, national policymakers will really uh, affect those key, key stakeholders. I come to that later. An overview of motor maps worldwide. This is a, uh, um, an overview which is, um, which has a date because um, um, this is a sort of continuous uh, movement from regions, countries, movement upwards towards higher efficiency levels. Um, I'm sure, so upwards to higher efficiency levels of maps. Efficiency levels are here um, this, uh, um, as defined in this uh, standard, as, as I showed before, um, and all based on these testing standards of preferred method, preferred testing method. Uh, what we see is this upward movement. For instance, we see now um, that the EU will move upwards to I3 um, by 2015. Uh, I3 is mandatory, and by 2017, um, even smaller modules will also be included in uh, as I3 as minimum. Uh, we see also China, which uh, will join uh, I3 level at, uh, uh, from next year on. And of course, uh, USA as and Canada as one of uh, two, uh, one important region where uh, were the first to be at I3 level. <coughs> okay. Um, so this is something uh, where a continuous uh, movement is uh, taking place. And um, I must say, USA, um, of course, has a different set of, of uh, uh, standardization. It's called NEMA, which is directly comparable with uh, I3. Those maps will lead, we hope, to uh, uh, a change in um, the 
number of motors of different uh, efficiencies. This slide shows us a uh, impression of uh, the motor sales, global motor sales. Um, looking backwards, they're based on real motor sales data. Looking ahead, for coming years, it's a projection of what uh, the uh, IHS expects uh, from sales. And here we see that the, the IE1, the lowest efficiency class, uh, starts lowering in number of sales, and then the I2 and I3 grows. So it's sort of um, shows us the effectiveness of maps, you could say, with a sort of really long jump because it's not real hard evidence. But on a global level, we can see a shift towards more efficient models. And that's a, that's a good thing to see. Um, but also what we see is that there's no direct link between uh, shift from, for instance, I2 to I3. We don't see a one-to-one -one shift to higher sales. And it has uh, the following reasons. Because making this the shift towards a uh, higher efficiency class uh, affects sales for new equipment and some replacement of old equipment. But the large is huge installed base of motors is not really affected that quick. So the implementation rate of speed of more efficient motors is quite low. So it takes more than maps only to really harvest those um, energy savings of, with efficient motor systems. A short overview of the European situation uh, with maps. Here we have uh, three kinds of maps, applications in place. On motors, we have maps uh, in place, which are now revised. And they will be um, lead to extra uh, regulation, so to say, uh, within the next years. Well, there's a technical study completed. And we expect that the new maps or the revised maps will include a larger range of uh, output power, from very small motors to very large motors. VFDs will also be included is the expectation, as well as, for instance, explosive proof models. <coughs> Excuse me. Fence also, we see there that um, the, the regulation is also being revised. And there, the new regulation will be, uh, will have an increased efficiency tier level, which will be affected from 2020 on. Compressors, there is a technical study, but maps are still not uh, really come into place. Uh, industry and EU are still in discussion on what the real the best measures would be. And for water pumps, there also the maps is, in, is, is being uh, is planned to be revised starting from next year. So as we saw in some slides ago, that uh, this whole maps scheme is continuously continuously in, in movement. That's a good thing. Key stakeholders um, about um, policies, defining policies on, on motor systems. Uh, we see that the, the national policy makers, those are, so to say, the people, the organizations who are at the steering wheel. Um, and they affect. Um, International standards makers to start with. If national policy makers want to put into effect maps, they really need uh, international standards to deal with. So that's that's one thing. Um, with that, they can um, affect, of course, manufacturers because the manufacturers have to put into uh, to place to the market their more efficient motor, motor, motor systems, components. Um, and they affect, of course, the industrial users, because that's where they really the energy savings have to take place. They have to implement their, their and to revise the motor systems. Depending on the national situation, we also see that power utilities can have an important role. For instance, in the United States, power utilities do play that important role with all kinds of rebate programs. Um, so the bottom line is, bottom line is here that, that the most effective policies stimulate action. The most effective policies 
designed by policymakers to stimulate action upon manufacturers, standard makers, the power utilities, and the industrial users. Some examples of successful policy implementation are described in some publications made uh, by EMSA. Uh, we have uh, three publications available, shown here, the Motor Maps Guide, the Motor Policy Guide, and the Policy Guidelines for Electric Motor Systems. All three you can find on our website, motorsystems.org. Um, upcoming is a paper on a roadmap for electric motors and VFDs. This will be uh, published uh, the coming month and also will be made available through our website. And we're currently working on two new publications on called Policy Guidelines for Motor Driven Units. Here we make the step from, from motors, motors plus VFD, towards the uh, motor driven units, also um, consisting of the transmission and the application itself, uh, the pumps, the compressors, the fans. So, um, as a conclusion for this section, I would like to point out programs, what are the main policy instruments we need um, for this. We need um, uh, mandatory audits, audits um, where we have a standard protocol for, uh, which are mandatory. Uh, end users do have to uh, um, extra those audits every now and then in order to make sure that they really get the, uh, the efficient measures uh, applicable to their specific situation. In Europe, this is now in place. We have the European Energy Efficiency Directive, which makes it uh, mandatory for larger companies to execute such an audit every three years, three or four years, I'm not sure. Um, then financial incentives. Um, Important also is that there should be some financial incentive for end users um, to do those system analysis. And there we say that uh, at EMSA that it's not really worthwhile to have a financial incentive for the motor exchange itself, but far more for the system analysis, because this means you have cost upfront uh, in order to get really the picture where you can save money, energy with, your, with an efficient motor system. Uh, and that's, that's really a barrier for many end users to even start with this uh, subject. Thirdly, efficiency targets. Uh, we need negotiated target setting for at least five to ten years ahead because with those targets, it's important for national governments but also for trade associations and end users to really get into action to do something about it and to really uh, define actions which make sure that you really reach those targets within the five, ten years now. And then we have the training programs, the capacity building for factory personnel, in-house factory personnel, but also for energy experts in the industry. Uh, having training programs in place for those uh, people makes it um, much more uh, possible to really get those measures implemented. <coughs> 